If my mental processes are determined wholly by emotions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 44, C.S. Lewis's Dangerous Idea, After Hours with Dr. Victor Rappert. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your favourite weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where Andrew, Matt and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we've worked our way through Lewis's book, The Four Loves, we then had Ecumenism Month, where we spoke to Lewis lovers from diverse religious backgrounds. And we're now in Apologetics Month, and we're examining some of Lewis's favourite arguments for, among other things, theism and Christianity. Today we're talking about the argument from reason, and our guide through this apologetic argument is a man whose name is synonymous with it, Dr. Victor Rappert. Dr. Victor Rappert received his PhD from the University of Illinois and is the adjunct professor of philosophy at Glendale Community College in Arizona. He's active in several C.S. Lewis societies and has written articles on Lewis's apologetics for journals such as the Christian Scholars Review, Philosophia Christi, and the International Journal of Philosophy of Religion. He also appeared in a documentary with Dr. John G. West, who began our Apologetics Month, as well as the book which Dr. West edited called The Magician's Twin. Most importantly, he's the author of the book C.S. Lewis's Dangerous Idea, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. Dr. Victor Rappert, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thank you. For our interview, I am drinking some green tea, and we're toasting patron supporter Michael Kelly. And since we're talking about reason today, Michael, we raise a glass to you. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Cheers. Cheers to you. Okay, so today we are talking about the argument from reason, and so this is a wonderful opportunity to have someone on the show who understands this argument really, really well, and we're going to be able to look at some of the objections to it and how we might respond to it, as well as talk about his book, C.S. Lewis's Dangerous Idea. Now, one thing that I've noticed is that some people just simply dismiss Lewis as a philosopher, and so perhaps a good way to begin this interview is uh, for you just to talk a little bit about Lewis's background in philosophy and his philosophical journey, because his journey towards faith and the argument from reason are rather inextricably linked. But first, would you mind speaking to this dismissiveness which some people have when they think of Lewis as a philosopher? There is a substantial amount of dismissiveness of, of just C.S. Lewis as a thinker uh, in the philosophical community, and it does affect the Christians as well as atheists. You know that that is that is out there. It's it's a it's an odd sort of prejudice in virtue of the fact uh, that if you look at Lewis's uh, personal history, you find out that he got like first in three as an undergrad, he like passed three areas. One of them is called greats. That's basically what it what would now be. If, if if you got a position in greats, you know you'd get to you'd, you'd be considered a professional philosopher, right? And that's what mm -hmm. people there were there were people that got those. Uh, and he ended up, I think, he had great mods and English literature. Is these three things he got these first in, and he felt well. About all I'm going to be good at doing in life is being an academician. Academician. And so, he, but he had these three areas. The first thing he really pursued after completing his undergraduate career was great. And he got a, you know, he got a master's degree or whatever in that. And he pursued philosophy. He actually tutored philosophy at Oxford University. Now, how many people who think that Lewis is too philosophically superficial to take seriously as a thinker in the 21st century, uh, could get a job as a, as a philosophy tutor at Oxford University, you know, in your wildest dreams, buddy, okay? Mm. Um, not very many. No. But this was a temporary position as a replacement for his 
mentor, a philosophical mentor at that time, a guy by the name of E.F. Carrot. Okay. So he actually then gets very close to earning a position as a philosophy position at Trinity College Oxford. Okay. He's, it's, it's like two people going for it and the other guy gets it. All right. So he's this close to had ending up in a career in philosophy. He ends up feeling, well, this probably wouldn't be the best thing for me to do, the thing I'd really be happiest doing. And so he didn't get that position. He said, well, I've, I've got to make a career in, in, in academics. I'm going to have to go back to my literature background and get a degree in that. He gets a degree in that, and then he gets a post, as you know, a tutor of um, medieval and Renaissance lit. But he's also all this time he's going from now. Actually, when he was when he was getting about to get a philosophy, he was actually not a, a religious uh, Christian at all. He was uh, uh, he starts off as accepting a form of naturalism, which which he called realism. Okay, but it's 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 a Platonistic form of naturalism. It, he says that it's it's one of the best expressions of his old position. It was an essay by Bertrand Russell called A Free Man's Worship. So, and uh, uh, Lewis, in, in, in a lot of his writings, uh, in several places, he makes reference to this one essay by Bertrand Russell called A Free Man's Worship. Now, Lewis and Russell are kind of opposite numbers in the, in the history. I mean, it would have, been, would have been great to have a Lewis-Russell debate that everybody reads like they like they read the the Russell Copleston debate, you know. Which I, I I actually still went back and read the Russell Copleston debate. It's interesting, you know. Russell's a really interesting guy. Would have had if, if they had if they had been firing back at one another, it would have been incredibly, incredibly entertaining. You know, it, it's it'd be better than even the uh, uh, William Lane Craig Keith Parsons debate, which is uh, which is to my mind. I have, I know if you if you follow these debates that these people have but uh it to me that's my that's 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 the gold standard of atheist christian encounters okay is is this debate that took place in texas between dr keith parsons who was my ex housemate <laughs> who's the atheist and william lane craig was christian okay uh it would have been great to have this debate c.s lewis Bertrand russell debate okay but never happened I think Russell was too contemptuous of Lewis. So they, they just, yeah, they, it, you can bet the farm that uh, there were all sorts of entreaties sent out from the Oxford Socratic Club to, to Bertrand Russell to come in, uh, but it never happened. He was in a, uh, Russell was in America a lot of the time. I don't, I've, I've often wanted to ask somebody, you know, if, if there was ever an attempt to actually bring Russell in to the Oxford Socratic Club. And have him, you know, have it out with the AJ Air was actually had one of those exchanges with it was actually a, a, a presentation by this other guy by the name of Foster. And AJ Ayer showed up at it and and Ayer's uh, comment blasted Foster's position. And rather than Foster's actually defending his own position, uh, Lewis took up his side and there was this there was this rather interesting exchange. Uh, between A.J. Ayer and uh, C.S. Lewis at the Oxford Socratic Club. So, so anyway, so what happens here is he's nearly, he, he nearly becomes a professional philosopher. He goes into medieval and Renaissance literature. World War II comes along, and people are aware that Lewis is a intellectual convert, that he was originally an atheist, that he became a religious believer, and they start coming to him with requests to write things. And at that time, wartime, there, there were fewer students to tutor. So he, he, his, his teaching responsibilities were somewhat lower. And he felt he had a kind of patriotic duty because, you know, I mean, there, there were some issues of right and wrong going on in World War II. And England has a state church. And people at the BBC felt that having him come in and exposit Christianity, you know, was something that was of value for the war effort. So he was asked to do, write the problem of pain. He wrote it. He 
He wrote screw tape letters. Then they want him to do um, your, uh, the, the lectures, the case for Christianity, Christian behavior, all that, that which turned into mere Christianity. Those were all broadcast talks, as you know. And then toward the end of World War II, Dorothy Sayers, uh, late in World War II, Dorothy Sayers says, you know, we've got a problem because a lot of people in Christian churches uh, read commentaries about the Bible and what the, what happens in there when they study these things is that they read these commentaries by people like Rudolf Bultmann and these commentators come at all the miraculous events of the New Testament basically using a principle of methodological naturalism which of course you know, Jesus walks on water and only had to know where the stones were. Maybe it didn't happen at all. You know? uh, if Jesus was resurrected, well, there was an Easter event there. We don't know what happened, but the, the claiming that it was a literal resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's now considered problematic because modern people don't believe this stuff anymore, okay? which is the, the famous statement, Boltmann, okay? And Boltmann is, is, in fact, basically does New Testament studies as if Hume's essay on miracles, basically Hume's essay on miracles is like 18th century essay, but it was adopted by a lot of 19th century historiographers of, about the life of Jesus. And basically what it says is any explanation for what happened at the foundation of Christianity is better than a miraculous explanation. And so Lewis comes along and is asked to write a book that challenges that methodological naturalism on the part of, of biblical scholars and says that argues that biblical study, doesn't, he doesn't prove that the miracles happen, but he says you at least have to uh, uh, examine miracles with an open mind to the possibility that the miracle might have actually happened, okay? And so in that book, Lewis uses one of the reasons, which shows up in a number of other essays. He says one of the reasons that he gets away from naturalism is he says, Russell's position really doesn't leave any room for a theory of knowledge. That is to say, if Russell's right, he doesn't have good reason to believe that he's right. Okay, why? Well, let's take let's 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 just take famous statements by Richard Dawkins. Okay, we all know Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Dawkins says, now, what's the difference between us good scientific atheistic thinkers and religious people? We in science. We accept what we believe on the basis of evidence. Okay. Well, okay. That means, Richard, look what you look what you've just committed yourself to. You are claiming that in your case, there was a mental the mental event of uh, that you you have basically what you have as evidence that you you, you had certain mental states. And then there were some certain logical rules of, of evidence for evidence usage, right? These are logical principles, evidential principles, whatever. And that produced your belief. That is, that is a kind of causation, right? It, it's, it's what would be called mental causation, right? In other words, a mental event in virtue of its logical and uh, epistemological characteristics brings about your belief. And you're saying, you're telling me that you believe what you believe because this happens. Now let's look at the way Dawkins describes the actual world. In the final analysis, nothing that happens in the world is because of reasons. But if that's true, then Dawkins' own belief that evolution is true isn't because of reasons, because reasons don't do anything in the world, right? Therefore, if you insist, which no atheist ever went, ever, ever says this, they never say, say, well, I just happen to believe in atheism. 
Okay. Or I, my brain just happens to be programmed for atheism. That's why I'm an atheist. That justifies my atheism. Uh, -uh. they don't say that. What do they say? They say, we've got the evidence. We've got the evidence of evil against the existence of God. We've got the evidence of evolution against creation. You know, the very title of Dawkins, uh, the blind watchmaker, he says, the blind watcher, how the evidence of evolution reveals a world without design. But if you have a world without design, then the evidence of evolution can't reveal anything to you, right? Because there's no mental causation that mental events one mental event can never cause another mental event, right? It's only physical events that cause physical events for physical reasons. And if that's the case, your very position refutes itself, right? You can't possibly hold that position, right? Because the more evidence you produce for it, the more evidence you produce that there's real mental causation in the world and your very system is inimical to that, okay? So that's the guts of the argument from reason. Okay, now there are some differences in the way Lewis, de the way Lewis develops it. He says that basically a, a naturalistic view of the world is perforce a deterministic one. So that everything is literally determined by physical causes, okay? And he's aware that there's quantum mechanics out there He's actually, he and Einstein, at least with respect to the physical world, kind of agree. Einstein says God doesn't play dice with the universe, right? And just, just can't get his head around. Einstein just could, could never get his head around quantum mechanics and indeterminism at the physical level. And Lewis has the same problem, actually. He, and he says that if you did accept that kind of position, naturalists, this would actually undo naturalism because uh, there wouldn't be anything preventing the control on the on supernatural events would be eliminated. Modern thinkers have kind of gone against Lewis on this particular claim. They say, no, what we believe in is something which they, they describe as chance and necessity physicalism. And that is to say, there's chance, there's physical necessity. Both of these are mindless processes. It's a bottom-up system. It means that in the final analysis, what really happens in the world has nothing to do with reasons. Okay? That uh, the reasons or mind or anything like that. Uh, Daniel Dennett's uh, book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. Well, that's where I swiped his title and put Lewis's name in there instead of Darwin. Okay, well, there's a reason why I did that. Uh, Dennett is addressing, uh, he, he actually thinks that, that, uh, that atheism is pretty much proved. He's, he's a, he, he wrote another book later defending atheism. But this book, uh, in Darwin's Dangerous Idea, he says, well, there are a bunch of thinkers out there who, even though, even though they, they may not be religious believers, they basically put mental explanations in and do not claim that in the final analysis, it's really just physical stuff going on, you know, in the world. And he said, those people are kind of losing their nerve and they're not being consistent. The thing that cuts it, that should come down from from the, what we've discovered from Darwin's theory of evolution is that what, what we call a skyhook, that is to say, a, men, a mind first explanation is unacceptable. That, that what, you, what you want are, are basically cranes that sort of build up from the bottom, right? An explanation of whatever is out there, not just that there's a mind doing it. Okay, so it has to be something, something non-mental in the final analysis. Everything that happens is supposed to be non-mental in the final analysis. That's 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 Dennis' thesis. So when I come along and I say, no, wait, C.S. Lewis has a dangerous idea too, and that is, buddy, if you take that argument to its logical conclusion, Daniel Dennett, you are basically taking a gun to the entire scientific enterprise and and firing it off. Right, because you will not be able to say what Richard Dawkins says about people in science, namely that they, not these benighted people over in the churches, right, but these, but we in the sciences, we draw our conclusions based on evidence. Uh, doesn't work.
it, it won't work because in the last analysis, you don't draw your conclusions based on evidence. You, in fact, are simply the byproduct of, of one physical thing causing another physical thing. And therefore, that means that your claim to have discovered what you believe based on evidence is false advertising. <laughs> it didn't happen. Okay, it never happened. Uh, you write books as if you think the ev that there is evidence for evolution, ev evidence for atheism, evidence for the, but in fact, it never happens that for you know, just just take oh I don't know um, Darwin concluding based on the evidence he looks at f at with the Galapagos finches right. He, he develops a natural selective theory as to why the, the, the finch beaks are one way in one place and the other way in the other place, right? Well, we all know that story, right? But that assumes that Darwin's mind can go from one mental state to another state based on evidential roles, not by physical causation. So in other words, it essentially presupposes that what Dennett calls Darwin's dangerous idea is false. <laughs> uh, that's the way I kind of like to spell the guts of the argument out, you know, these days. Would you say that it's an argument for theism? If so, could it be charged with the God of the Gaps fallacy in terms of we don't know how this works, so a mind did it? Or is it more of an argument against naturalism? That's an interesting one. Uh, and God of Gaps argument is, are, are fascinating. Are, are, it's, it's a kind of fascinating charge. I mean, presumably anybody trying to establish, trying to say that there's something that the atheistic worldview can't explain, they can come back and say, well, okay, that's just a God of the gaps claim, okay? Is it a theistic argument? Well, it drove Lewis off naturalism. Now, let's, let's just look at Lewis's history. Lewis says, okay, there has to be, there has to be a fundamentally mental universe. And he says, okay, and he's, he suffers from what Thomas Nagel, who's going to be a very interesting figure in all of this, calls the fear of religion. He doesn't want he doesn't want anything anybody to obey, you know, anybody to 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 worship. But he's come to turn. He's trying to come to terms with the fact that there is there has to be the universe has to be at base mental, and he has not, he has a way out. And in that day, the position that is out there for him to take is called absolute idealism. Now, absolute idealism says, well, everything is, 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 is really a mind, so there really isn't any physical causation. Now, this is, this, these are guys, F.H. Bradley, Bernard Bosenkay, Thomas Green Hill. This is like, I mean, if you... If you, if you think about the big names in in philosophy at a particular time, like for example in the fifties and sixties, I mean everybody knew about Wittgenstein, right? Anska, you know, people like you know, And today, you know, there's you know when, when I was a grad student, everybody knew Saul Kripke, Hilary Putnam, W. V. Quine. But when Lewis was a graduate student, everybody had read F. H. Bradley. Everybody had read F. H. Bradley. He, he was probably as famous in Lewis's day as Quine was. Quine has been more recently. But anyway, Lewis said, ah, I'm going to be an absolute idealist. Okay. Now there is there is this absolute mind, but it's not distinct from the universe. It kind of is the universe. But basically what you say about the universe is it is it is essentially mental and not physical. Okay. It's largely a it's a pantheistic view. It has a lot of similarities to Hinduism, actually, the, 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 the views of these absolute idealists. Uh, is that theism? Eh. It's uh, it, it 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 has some of the features of theism. But it's not a personal deity. And Lewis then rejects that position because I think he thinks it's unclear. It's got a lot of unclarity to it. It isn't. Uh, actually, I found in Miracles an argument against this position 
uh, that says, if this were true, if, if, the, if the world were literally a mind and uh, my thoughts were simply part of the mind of God, then how come I make mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> so and he's got, uh, and, and then he has a whole chapter later in Miracles on attacking what's called Christianity religion. And it's a critique of absolute idealism slash Hinduism slash whatever he held back before after he rejected what would be called naturalism. So is it a theistic argument? Well, the arguments against absolute idealism don't seem to be the typical arguments from reason where you say everything is in the final analysis physical processes, okay? But it, it's kind of theism-like. And now Thomas Nagel basically says, reason is in some sense fundamental to the universe. So he, he says, you, you've got to somehow build reason and the mind as something sort of fundamental to the universe. But he calls himself an atheist. Okay. He gives, in some ways, he gives some very powerful expression to a lot of the arguments that I would use as arguments for reason. Now, here, here's the funny thing. Amongst naturalists, he gets just incredible amount of brickbats from those guys, from the Dan Daniel Dennett's of the world and other people. Because if he, in the last analysis, he ends up saying that there is no... Darwinian explanation of reason. Natural selective explanations for reason don't work. And he, used to be, he, was, he didn't just say that in this book called Mind and Cosmos. He said it way back in The View from Nowhere. He's been saying this for years. Openly comes out and with Mind and Cosmos comes out and says Darwin was wrong with a significant substantial uh, group within the atheist camp. Uh, that's world-class heresy. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, you know, uh, just, you know, you are, you are, you are, you are, you're really a religious believer. Yeah. <laughs> well, he said, no, I'm an atheist, but nevertheless, that's, so, so, so is the argument from reason a theistic argument? Well, in Lewis's case, it drove him off this Platonistic materialism of Bertrand Russell. It required him to hold that Reason is fundamental and basic to the universe. Okay. But it still left it open for him to hold out against theism or much less even Christianity uh, until still later. But on the other hand, you got to say it really cuts down your options. If you don't, if you are like, uh, like Thomas Nagel, right? He says, I don't want there to be a God. <laughs> I hate the idea of there being a God, okay? And I think I can make sense of all of this without actually becoming a theist. But as I say, it cuts your options down because there, they, they, there is a large mainstream viewpoint that says everything is, is in the last analysis physical the causation world is physical in the final analysis. And of course, even with some of them, some of these people on the, on the atheistic side, they say, well, there aren't really any beliefs or desires. That's not really, you know, we're, we're going to do the science about the mind. We're going to do the, we're going to study the brain. If you can't find, find beliefs in the brain, that means there aren't any beliefs. And, uh, that, and to say that there are beliefs is just folk psychology. Hmm. So anyway, uh, so that's the, that's, it. is it a theistic argument? Yeah, it kind of drives you that way. Yeah. And of course, my answer to it is, the, my explanation for why there is a mind is that, you know, we're creatures of God and that God creates us with minds. Is this a God of the gaps argument? Well, I, 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 I have kind of problems with the whole, the people just slap that onto every, Every naturalistic problem, if you point out it, you point out there's a natural problem with a naturalistic understanding of something, ah, God of the gaps. Uh, if, you, if you think God explains it, that's just a God of the gaps. You're just being lazy. Well, the problem there is, look, let, let's take, let's take Jesus's turning water into wine for a moment, okay? 
suppose that actually happened, that at the beginning of the party, there were these vats of water. Jesus went and did something. And in virtue of what he did, you now had several vats of good wine. Better wine than they had they had at the beginning of the party. Okay? All right. If that happened, you could say, well, first century science probably didn't have a good explanation for how that could happen. Right? But as science progresses, won't we eventually discover how naturalistically water can become wine? Uh, and the answer is no. As science has progressed, what's happened? It, it, it's become more and more evident that there's no way, that, uh, unless something happens contrary to, to physics, uh, water is not going to become wine. Okay. The so God of the gaps can be replaced by a naturalism of the gaps. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's like, okay, we're entitled to a naturalism of the gaps at every point. We can, in fact, um, I, don't, I don't see that that's the case. Number two, the, the gap between mental and physical, I think is logical conceptual. All right. What it means is that basically, if you're saying that it's all physical at the ground, right, well, that's what, it, that's what you're committed to. You, the very definition of the physical, if you try to actually develop a definition of what it is for events in the world to be physical, this is often contrasted with the mental, right? So what that means is that the very definition of what it is for somebody physical is it excludes the mental. Now, if the if the physical can allow mental causation, that's like that would be like a massive scientific revolution. It, it's, it's admitting causes at, at the very basic level of analysis that are traditionally not permitted in science. Okay, so you literally have to change the rules. You have to change the rules of science in order to allow uh, those sorts of mental causal, causal relations to occur. And science does have it have its revolutions, you know, but that's a big revolutionary change. And it's it's it, it, it's it's very metaphysically laden. And if you say it's literally true that you have mental causation, right, which I think Dawkins has this to say literally true. I came to believe in my atheism because of the lack of evidence for theism. I, I came to believe in a world without design based on the evidence of evolution. That's what he says. Uh, and if he says that, then basically he's, we've got to ask what kind of causation is, is, he, is, is happening there. And that has real issues with regards to free will. And I find a lot of atheists are actually now freely giving up free will and saying, no, nope, don't have it. It's just an illusion. Yeah, right. Free, free, free will is, well, now you've got to understand, though, that for that in philosophy, there are two definitions of free will. There is a definition of free will that says if you have a desire and you have the power to carry that out and you carry out that desire, then you've acted freely. That's it. That's all you need. And it's called compatibilist theory or soft determinism. You know, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And now, so long as you are a realist about mental states, which, which, by the way, this theory of free will uh, allows, uh, then you believe in free will in that sense, all right? But then, then, then there's another view of free will that says, well, wait a minute now. Yeah, I do what I want to do, but what made me do what I, I want to do? I mean, what made me want to do it in the first place? And, you know. Where did the desires come from? It's going to turn out that there's a, a, a physical causal process going back before I was born, which guarantees that, let's say, you know, I, let's say I make a decision to commit a murder. Okay, then there's this physical process that goes back before I was born that guarantees that I will commit this murder at this particular time. Uh, if that's really what happened, can we really say that in some deep sense, I'm really responsible for that murder because given that physical causal process that, that, that antedated my murder, 
I could not have done otherwise from what I did. Mm -hmm. That guaranteed that I would go ahead and do what I did. Uh, so when people say there's no free will, they, they assume, I think, that you need to have something like, although I would make an argument that maybe even with compatible with free will, that's not even compatible with, with naturalism. Because in the last analysis, you actually need mental causation to get soft determinist free will to work. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because I, I, my action has to be the result of a desire. I wanted to kill the person. I had, I had, I had motive for killing him. They'd stolen my wife. Uh, they would ruined my career. Uh, I was very, very angry with them. I stood to benefit if they if they died. So I put the strychnine in their in their coffee, right? And they drank it and they died. I killed that person because I wanted them to die. Well, if there's no mental causation, that's not even possible. Mm -hmm. That 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 didn't happen. Okay. And we naturally think we have libertarian free will. We don't think that we are purely slaves to our environment. That's not how we generally experience it. In my experience, it's only when you, when you see the logical consequence of that that people actually start pushing back on it and they're willing to deny something that to the everyday man seems so incredibly obvious. Of course, I freely chose. It seems, I, I, I mean, if you just, 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 just think about the Bible for a minute, you know, right? You know, you have God performs these creative actions and he says, God did this and said it was good. God did this, said it was good. God did this and said it was good, right? So, uh, so then, then God gives a command to, to Adam, right? The serpent comes along and says, go ahead and do what, what, what God told you not to. Then Eve does it. Then Adam does it, right? And then, at the end, then after that, God comes along and says, you did something I didn't want you to do. Serpent, you're crawling your belly. Uh, Eve, you're going to have a tough time with childbirth. Uh, and Adam, you're going to have to work really hard just, just to stay alive. And that story makes sense if somehow all three of these characters had the power to decide one way or the other, right? Hmm. But if, in fact, each was determined to do what they did, then the story starts not making any sense, right? Hmm. Because in the last house, I mean, God somehow set things up so that the serpent would tempt Eve, Eve would take the fruit, and then Adam would take the fruit, you know. Uh, and just, just in the ordinary course of life, I mean, just we, 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 we look at just something that happened yesterday, the, the, the horrific shooting in, in the state of Texas, right? How would we view something like that if we thought no one had free will? Right. And some atheists do say, well, we'd have to lock them up anyway, but it's not their fault. Something's, something's gone wrong with the machine here. Mm. Uh, you know, we need to fix it. Right. The, the sense of, of, of moral outrage that, that we have or, you know, where we, we, we say we want to hold people accountable for, for this guy getting these weapons. And so that, that seems to presuppose, you know, that, that people have choices, at least I would think, and that their and the, the libertarian account seems to me to be the account that makes sense of uh, of that view. And I don't see any uh, I, I, I and determinism. If I really accept a deterministic view of that, then I, my reaction to that whole scenario uh, changes drastically, at least I think anyway. Our, our natural reaction to such a horrific event under determinism is like being angry at a rock for falling when we drop it out of a window. Actually, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, quotes uh, uh, a wonderful scene from Faulty Towers where, uh, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. Where Basil Faulty gets very, very angry with his car for not starting, right? And starts beating on it, okay? <laughs> okay, you know... Uh, if, if determinism is true, uh, and, and actually Dawkins in this little piece in edge.org or whatever says, let's stop bashing Faulty's car. In other words, let's start, let's give up on this notion, putting people in prison, holding them accountable for their actions, saying that they're to be, feel guilty for something they did, that they've done something wrong, etc. That's like what Basil was doing to his poor old car. <laughs> and uh okay uh that's but 
that seems to be the consequences of determinism there. Mm. And that's, uh, that, that's the deal here. But anyway, we haven't talked about Anscombe yet, have we? <laughs> well, just before we get to Anscombe, I think it's interesting that the argument from reason, it, it naturally leads to these other areas about, I've seen an argument from God based on libertarian free will and Lewis's argument from morality, we've hinted at that as well. So a lot of these arguments, even though they're separate arguments, are also related. And just one last thing, I'm a software engineer, so I like to think about code. And it seems to me that if you're going to deny the Christian worldview and go with a strict materialist view, it's just like having a subroutine. And that's all we are. We have inputs, they all have natural outputs. Yeah, and, 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 and what replaces the programmer is evolution. But it also points to the question of artificial intelligence, because if you're, go if you're going to buy that model of what brains are, that brains are simply basically programs and really nothing more, that has consequences for artificial intelligence, whether you can have hard or soft AI, whether it is actually ever going to be possible. Because if you buy into the theory, then hard AI is entirely possible. And it's just a matter of when. Whereas soft AI, which says we can make a computer seem human, but not because the brain is only similar to a computer program. Now, the, the, good, the, good old, the good old Turing test, you know. <laughs> can you win the imitation game here? <laughs> yeah, and I think you can, but there's a massive jump from there to it being like a human in every respect. The thing is, you know, with, with these computers, I mean, it, it, looks, it, it looks like the very... And people sometimes, oh, well, physical systems can do rational things. Look at what Stockfish just did, just did to you in your, in like your last chess game with him. <laughs> okay, I, I, know, I, I know how good Stockfish is. Okay, I'm a chess player. I, I, Stockfish is absolutely a monster, but it has no understanding. The understanding of positions uh, was put in there by strong chess players. You know, there, there's no thrill of victory. There's no agony of defeat. There's no sense, but because it, is, it has a system has a system for evaluating positions and it can it can look at every single position, uh, it turns out to be a better player than Magnus Carlsen. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's not really technically it's not really playing chess. Okay. You you if you feel like you've been creamed, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's through with you, you know, uh, but it's not really playing chess, strictly mm -hmm. speaking. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of course, the, the real advocates of what we call strong AI are people who, they, in, in fact, uh, Daniel Denna has called anybody who rejects strong AI or whatever, uh, even people like John Searle, Thomas Nagel, uh, Jerry Fodor, he calls all those people a bunch of mind creationists. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he, I'd be a mind creationist too. But see, calling somebody creationist, I mean, that's, that's, that's an easy way of refuting them without actually arguing with them. <laughs> The ultimate slur. <laughs> so yeah, there there are, there are these overtones for uh, science, and people say, "Well, we've discovered." Actually, Richard Carrier, right after my book came out, wrote a book, really a, a, a article on on internet infidels. He set it up to be printed out. It's actually one page longer than my book, which, on my view, gives Richard Carrier the opportunity to commit the same mistake over and over again. <laughs> What he does is he, he defines intentionality in terms of intentionality and says it's, it, it, has a, it has a naturalistic explanation because if something about something else, it, you, you don't really define, you just, you, you can't give a circular definition for it and then say, well, nat nature explains it. Eh, no, yeah, that didn't work, Richard. <laughs> uh, but yeah, is it that Carrier's, uh, Carrier was the first big respondent. I've, I've had respondents. John Beversluis says in, in his revised edition of C.S. Lewis and the Search for Rational Religion. Very interesting. I think a very interesting book, although yeah, I, I can't disagree with it more on most things, but you know, <laughs> but he wrote the second edition out. He responded to what I had to say. Uh, and then I got I've gotten into exchanges with David Kyle Johnson uh, more recently on uh, on that. I, I, I give us an exchange in Philadelphia Christie, but there is also an exchange in a in a C.S. Lewis's apologetics book, pro and con. I took the pro side, he took the con side, and uh, on there. So there there are a number of, of debates that I, I I've engaged people. I've engaged people like Keith Parsons, my old housemate, uh, a few times in a Philo and Philadelphia Christie. Um, people yeah, you know, people like that. I, I, I tried in my work on uh, on this argument, try to engage people who 
come up on the other side and try to challenge it. And I'm, I'm always glad when, when people do in a way, because the other way to deal with, with, with this kind of argument is just ignore it, mm-hmm. which is, I think, what a lot of people would rather do. They just ignore it, ignore the problem, you know, uh, and just say, oh, it can't possibly be right. You know, for a lot of these people, it's, 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 easy, it's easier to be dismissive. So if somebody actually gives you some arguments, uh, it's a good, idea, good idea to pay attention to them. Mm. And it's one of my goals next season. I would like to have an episode on Beversluis because he responds to a lot of Lewis's stuff. So I'm looking for- Died last year. I died in 21. I, I corresponded with him from around the time my book first came out. I think maybe even before that until he passed away, off and on. Hmm. Interesting guy. The only person to really do serious, actually tackle Lewis and argue against him. Now that's you know in in an across the board way. Mm-hmm. Uh, guy, have you ever have you ever met or interviewed uh, Stephen John J. Lovell? No. He wrote he wrote a master's thesis at or was it University of Sheffield? Uh, no, a doctoral dissertation. Guy actually got his doctorate on a broad general defense of C.S. Lewis's writings. Oh, I'm going to have to talk to him. Well, speaking of people who push back against Lewis, there is the popular idea that Lewis was defeated in debate by the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe. And it's often reported that after that experience, he just gave up all attempts to rationally defend the faith and instead retreated to writing children's stories. So, Why bloody blazes would he would he revise would he revise his chapter if that happened? Well, this is it. Please, please tell us what it's happened. It's the size. It's its original size. I mean, you know, come on, you know, it's it's a fascinating story because remember, Lewis has got a philosophy background. He's also the founder of the Oxford Socratic Club. He engages philosophers, C.E.M. Jode. He engages him at the club. He engages H.H. Price, who was a ma- major figure at the time. He engages A.J. Ayer. He engages Elizabeth Anscombe, and he engages uh, J.J.C. Smart on criminal punishment. So he's still engaging with philosophers here, right? And uh, the exchange with J.J.C. Smart, I think, is after the Anscombe incident. I think the Ayer one came before Anscombe, if I if I remember correctly. But of course, that was a that was a written exchange. Uh, but Smart replied to Lewis, and Lewis wrote back in this Australian journal of jurisprudence. <laughs> okay, throughout World War II, Lewis is president of the Oxford's Credit Club, constantly writing essays, doing presentations. World War II ends. You have a lot more undergrads now are coming back to Oxford. He's got more demands on his time. Mrs. Moore is deteriorating. He's got more. He's got demands on his time at home. It's getting worse for her. Not only that, but he's under pressure from Oxford University. He's been writing all these popular things, you know, the great divorce, the screw tape letters, miracles, problem of pain, mere Christian, all this stuff, right? You know, he's and people around him at the college said, "Well, wait a minute." Uh, it ain't what we hired you to do, buddy. <laughs> what you need to focus on is producing some real English literary scholarship. And he hadn't really produced anything since the al- allegory of love. And so he now has feels a very strong obligation to write this volume on 16th century literature for the Oxford history of English literature, which he calls, oh, hell, okay, <laughs> which kind of tells you what he thinks of the pressure being put on him uh, to get this done. But he's still going to the Oxford Socratic Club. And here comes Anscombe. Now, Anscombe, basically, the writings of Ludwig Wittgenstein, the later writings of Ludwig Wittgenstein, have not been published. Anscombe's the one who actually gets those Translated and published the blue book, the brown book, the uh, the philosophical investigations. All right. Anscom comes along and says we have to draw a very sharp distinction between reasons and causes. Reasons they're, they're just two different things. Thinking of it in Wittgensteinian terms, these are in two different language games. So 
you're claiming that because of the causal processes in the fiscal world, uh, that no one can say that there are that there are reasons for their beliefs. But reasons, causes, these are two, these are two completely different things. And in fact, you conflate several things. You you conflate different meanings of the words why, because, and explanation. You can say why, what's the reason, or why, how did it happen? And you also conflate irrational and not well, actually. Actually, Lewis actually draws a distinction himself uh, between two senses of the word irrational. One sense of the word irrational says, well, there are, there are mental processes going on, but something contrary to reason comes into the process so that people get wrong answers. For example, this is an example Lewis gives. If I walking by a house and I notice that there's a black dog in the yard, and I start getting scared, right? There are two ways in which that could happen. One is I got bit by the, a black dog when I was a little kid, and so black dogs just automatically scare me. Now, this dog could be like my late dog, Frisky, quite black and quite friendly and uh, not dangerous to much of anybody. In fact, my family used to put a sign, beware of dog in, 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 uh, on the fence. And I said, yeah, we should, yeah, people should beware of our dog. He may lick you to death. Okay. <laughs> But on the other hand, suppose I, I, I walk by this house and there's this black dog there. It's muzzled. It engages in a lot of aggressive behavior. I, I've seen evidence that the owners themselves, in fact, treat this dog as if that dog could do some harm. We really have to watch out to make sure it doesn't hurt people. In that case, then I've got a reason to believe that dog's dangerous. But on the other hand, if, if, if I'm just avoiding the house because it's, I have a phobia about black dogs, then that's, that's an irrational cause. But then there's another kind of irrational cause that just says, well, that's just a cause where reason isn't present. And Lewis's examples that explain why we have this rule, no thought is valid, can be fully explained in terms of irrational causes, they all actually involve ir not literally irrational causes. And back in Lewis's day, People were very Freudian. They, they, they used Freudian explanations for everything. I developed the concept of the idea of position called hyper-Freudianism, which says every belief that anybody ever has is due to a Freudian cause. So we explain Christians because they have a wish fulfillment, right? But we explain the atheists because they have an Oedipus complex. We explain, uh, you know, uh, Freud presumably could explain everybody away, in which case, what? We wouldn't even be able to argue the subject, right? But on the other hand, materialism seems to seems to have seems to be irrational in kind of a different way, namely that that reasons don't cause anything. And so Lewis really felt he had to correct his uh, his article. He had to start talking in terms of non-rational, and then he says, "Look, but." If grounds do exist, what exactly do they have to do with the actual occurrence of belief as a physical event or as a psychological event? If there are good grounds for a belief, how do they explain that belief? Anscombe, who is one to deny that reasons or causes, still said, hey, really, says, this is a problem. And what Anscombe thinks afterwards is, yeah, Lewis really developed a real problem here. The first thing Lewis does is he gives, he gives a very brief answer to Anscombe in the same very issue of the Socratic Digest, where her essay comes out. And it says, basically, okay, let's draw the distinction between reasons and causes. If we do, we, we still have the problem of how reasons are going to explain actual beliefs and in a way, the more sharply you draw your dis the, you, the distinction you're insisting on, the worse it gets for the naturalist. Is actually what Lewis says. Okay. But this is just like a brief two-paragraph response. What Lewis doesn't do for what uh, this is 1948 is when is is when the Anscombe Exchange takes place. Lewis revised this chapter in 1959 during the summer, and it comes out in 1960. So you, what you never get is like a full detailed, I, I pondered about this quite a bit because 
as a philosopher, if somebody had done that to my argument, then uh, as soon as I possibly could do it, I'd have an essay out called A Reply to Miss Elizabeth Anscombe's Argument that Naturalism is Not Self-Refuting. That's what I would have done. Uh, and so, because Lewis actually says, I don't buy your rebuttal as a defense, as a successful defense of naturalism. You point out maybe some problems with what I wrote, but so far as getting naturalism off the hook, if anything, you make things worse for them. Mm. Okay? And so what's interesting is Lewis doesn't pursue that, uh, doesn't then go back and write an essay like that. Why not? Well, it goes back to... He's really doing a lot of his writing is sort of a sidebar to his main job. And for him to actually respond and rebuild his chapter the way he wants to, it's a lot of hard work. It isn't what he wants to do every day. He's, he's focused on all these other things in his life and he, he writes Narnia and all that. It isn't that, that, that he can't do it. It's that he doesn't prefer to do it. It, it. it isn't it isn't the most fun thing for him to do. He's apologetics was never the most fun thing that Lewis, I mean Lewis loved debate and dialogue and he loved to argue back and forth with people. And he had he had his he, and, and he had his inklings around to 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 bounce things off of and you know it's Tolkien there and Williams and some of these other people. But on the other hand, he always found apologetics kind of wearing on him because it basically made his faith depend on the arguments. And it wasn't as if the arguments weren't important in producing his faith or putting him where he is. And it's not, not as if he didn't think there were good arguments. It was just that it kind of wore him down to, to be constantly in these discussions. Uh, and so he, uh, with problems at home with Mrs. Moore, with heavier workload at Oxford, with pressure to, to write the, the O Hill volume. And then of course, finally he leaves, he, he never gets a full professorship, right? And people say, let's get the reason nobody ever wants to give you a full professorship is because you're writing all this other stuff. And you aren't you aren't doing the actual scholarship that we want you to do, and so they never give him a full. He's he's a kind of prophet without honor in, in his home country. Cambridge comes along and says, "Okay." So so then he takes this full professorship over over at Cambridge, and he takes the he commute. He's actually a commuter. Uh, he lives in Oxford, and he commutes over to Cambridge for the rest of his life and his career. And then that's uh, and then of course he gets married, right? Takes on a couple of stepchildren and so forth. But throughout his career, it's very clear he still doesn't think naturalism is successfully defended, defensible. His posthumous is his posthumous book called um The Discarded Image. He's got a version of the argument against naturalism in there. And right in the middle of a grief observed where he has all these doubts about God, right? And he starts, well, now, is it possible maybe that materialism is really true? And, oh, no, no, no. The, 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 if physicalism is true, then basically you've got one cloud of atoms making a mistake about another cloud of atoms. That's an incoherent idea. Argument from reason all over again. Right in the middle of a grief observed, right in the middle of the very book that John Beversley says is grounds for thinking that Lewis dumped apologetics. Uh, uh, Beversley is, is interesting about this whole Anskin business because he's one of the people that actually wakes up to the fact that Lewis never gives up on his apologetics based on the incident with Anscombe. He attacks Humphrey Carper and A.N. Wilson for suggesting that, claiming that in fact they're just it's just contrary to the evidence which is very, very admirable on Beverly's part, someone who is, in general, as hostile to Lewis's apologetics as he is, that, that he manages, he figures out, I mean, in his first edition of C.S. Lewis and the Search for Rational Religion, he kind of implies that this, this is what I call the Anscombe legend, 
Lewis never thought that Anscombe refuted his argument. I mean, he, he may have he may have thought he refuted certain expressions of the argument or that they had been misstated. Uh, but he never thought, and, and the, the clearest piece of evidence is this little two-paragraph comment in the Oxford Socrat of the Socratic Digest in 1948, the very issue that Anscombe's essay comes out in. Uh, very decisive evidence. He's not convinced that, uh, that naturalism is off the hook. You know, I mean, these are interesting problems. Interestingly enough, naturalists don't even buy Anscombe's separation of reasons and causes. Mm. The naturalist, the, the standard naturalistic position was articulated by a philosopher in 1963 by the name of Donald Davidson. And Donald Davidson said, reasons are causes. Otherwise, they wouldn't explain why this is your main reason for doing something as opposed to something else. Uh, it's a very interesting essay. But what's interesting about Lewis is that Lewis's revised chapter gets virtually no attention when it comes out. And Anscombe only re reacts to it 21 years later. <laughs> I think part of this had to do with the fact that Lewis wrote the chapter, rewrote the entire chapter, goes to always bother to, to rebuild his argument, never mentions Anscombe in there once. And Anscombe's family, I think, uh, her husband, Peter Geach, and probably Anscombe herself were offended by that, you know, because there's no acknowledgement of it, you know, in there. I, I think Anscombe, well, she rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Okay. Uh, a very, a very great thinker, I think, but just, uh, just, uh, just her the way the way she projected herself, and the way in which this was picked up by the atheists in the club as well. We can dismiss Lewis now. You know he's, he got cream here uh, by a Roman Catholic, <laughs> but by 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 a Roman and a female. Uh, but the the funny thing is that I don't know what the rules were uh, back then, but I know when I present. When I, I, I've been a, a presenter and a commentator at American Philosophical Association meetings. And if I'm a commentator on a paper, I've actually seen the paper before I, before I comment on it. I write my comments up first. Lewis apparently had never seen this before. And I don't know how, if, she, if, if he knew who she was before then or what, what her reputation was. She, she, hadn't, she hadn't done any published work. And none of Wittgenstein's later writings had been translated for the public. So it's like this, this stuff comes out of nowhere. And I can imagine, I, I have this argument, you know, and here is a set of objections. I don't know where they're coming from exactly entirely. And I've got to come up with some responses to it in the discussion. And these were positions, the positions Anscombe took, I think, were very popular Around that time, they looked very good to people in that time. I think, if I'm right, that they'd be much more questioned today, I think. Uh, and also, Wittgenstein's whole philosophy, if you push it far enough, uh, it leads to the conclusion that, for example, um, I studied from a Wittgenstein student, this guy by the name of Winch, and he says, well, there's no conflict between Darwin and, and Genesis because they're in different language games. Okay. Well, you know, if you, if, if you say reasons and causes are in different language games, so there's no conflict, then why can't you also say Darwin and the creation story are in different language games? But can you imagine Richard Dawkins being told that there's no conflict between Darwin and Genesis because these are in two different language games, okay? Well, that Dawkins might ask, well, which of these language games cottons onto reality? And that's the question that Wittgenstein shoves aside. Because he doesn't think that there's this hook between language and reality. Dang. Okay. But there isn't some absolute reality. There's just different language games. That's it. And now I don't think Anscombe could really, could, could really follow Wittgenstein all that far. Because, for example, you can imagine Anscombe and Wittgenstein having a conversation about the Eucharist. And, and Wittgenstein says, what do you believe about the Eucharist? Says, well, it is the, this is my body, right? This is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. 
and Andrew Chang would come back and say, well, yes, I'm sure in, in your Roman Catholic language game, yes, that is. Now, over in the Protestant language game, it's not, right? And I think Anscombe would have to say, uh, no, <laughs> no, it's not just language games. <laughs> this is my body. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I don't think I, I, I don't think Anscombe could could be that kind of take this kind of position that that Wittgenstein's philosophy to its logical conclusion leads to. Interestingly enough, Anscombe never endorses what Lewis does, but it, it's interesting. There are two people, both of them are followers of Wittgenstein who present very much Lewis-like arguments against naturalism. And I know for sure that Anscombe looked at both of them. One of them is Norman Malcolm's essay, The Conceivability of Mechanism. It came out in 1968 in Philosophical Review. And he references Elizabeth Anscombe as somebody who looked at this. And the other is a guy by the name of Peter Geach who was married to Elizabeth Anscombe. And Geach says, anytime you try to explain reason or choice or language naturalistically, it's like, it's like the, you should treat it like the claim that the word to is rational. You know, it looks as if Geach actually, even though uh, was upset with, I think was upset with Lewis for not uh, acknowledging Anscombe in the essay, but accepted the conclusion of, of Lewis's argument that naturalism is a rational and coherent position. Uh, and I don't see any, any other way of reading this, this, this statement out of the virtues I quoted in, in C.S. Lewis's Dangerous Idea. Dr. Victor Rappert, thank you for coming on the show. All right, thank you. I hear the call for final drinks. So to wrap up, where can people go to find out more about you and pick up a copy of your book, C.S. Lewis's Dangerous Idea? Where can they get it? I don't know. Well, I, I, it's still up on Amazon, so just go in there, I guess. It's, it's InterVarsity Press, you know. Uh, I blog on uh, Dangerous Idea, though we cover all sorts of other stuff, you know, on there. Uh, big source for the argument if you, uh, if you is a book called, um, a couple of different books I would recommend on it. Uh, oh, there, there's, there's my chapter in um, of the Blackwell Companion Natural Theology volume. That's, uh, that is probably my most detailed, it's actually more detailed, I think, than C.S. Lewis' Dangerous Idea. Uh, a couple of other big sources for it, uh, if you want to study it. Uh, William Hasker wrote a book called The Emergent Self, which is basically an argument for a form of, of, of mind-body dualism. He uses that argument against materialism in the third chapter of that book. Uh, Bill and I were, were center fellows at the Center for Philosophy of Religion at University of Notre Dame, uh, and Alvin Planning was the head of that center. Alvin Planning had defended a, ver uh, a sort of inductive probabilistic version of the argument, which is called The Evolutionary Argument Against Naturalism. There is a book by Jim Slagle called The uh, Epistemological Skyhook. Uh, so a lot, a, lot, a lot of good sources there. Wonderful. Well, thanks again to Dr. Rappert for coming on the show. Thanks to all of our listeners, patron supporters, particularly our top tier supporters. Deborah 1, Deborah 2, Marvin, Joelle, Thomas, Anonymous, Bill, Joanna, Snort, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media. And be sure to check out our website, pintsforjack.com, for lots of extra links and resources. And please join us next time, when we'll continue going further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers to you.